who was the MP for Buckley and Spen, and she's had a marvellous career as an actor, and I think many of us will have seen her on our screens. <laughs> so um, I'd just like to say, can we give Tracy a real round of applause? <laughs> here this evening. You've uh, battled through the rain and the wind. We're so glad you've come out to see us. Uh, thank you, of course, Councillor Geoffrey, for such a warm welcome. I would also like to welcome some other special guests. We've got the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, Alison and intelligence, Sarah Eaton. <laughs> but of course, as Councillor Jeffrey says, it's all about you tonight. It's the opportunity for you to discuss the issues that impact you and where you live with Tracy, the West Yorkshire Mayor. I'm honoured to be your host. And just to let you know, I've chosen these questions. We got a lot of questions, which was fantastic. But I chose from a long list and picked ones that I felt covered a really wide range of topics and themes that we felt that would really cover the things that matter to you. So we're looking to a really we're looking forward to a really great discussion which will allow the mayor and her colleagues, if appropriate, to answer those questions rigorously. Um, we of course appreciate that people are passionate about these subjects and we don't always agree, which is alright. It's alright, we have different opinions, which doesn't seem to be fashionable anymore, but yeah, it's alright we don't agree, but we want to keep the discussion very respectful uh, tonight, polite not talk over one another and to you know not raise our voices and just keep it really nice and respectful then we can hear the answers properly um, first we'll deal with those specific questions that we've chosen that I have chosen and then that's for the first hour and the last 15 minutes we're going to open up the floor so anyone who's got a question and you think we haven't covered something please do put your hands up and we can cover as many topics as possible if a topic is going on a bit too long, we might have to just cut it short because we want to cover as much as we can tonight. Um, those of you with your questions, please will you read your question out so that everybody knows it in the audience here. And uh, just before the Mayor responds, we can just all hear the question that is uh, going to be answered. And also with some colleagues here, I think Mel is here with her microphone. So just wait for anyone with the microphone to come to you before you start your question. You two have also got mics if you turn on your, I think, on your belt. Yeah, thank you, I think mine's on. Thank you. Mine was on. Yes, mine was on. Yeah, it's lit off. Oh, it's like being at the BBC. Oh, ah, there we are. <laughs> yeah, it's like being at the BBC. I'm sure you could hear me though, because I'm not very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll just reiterate that, that for the first hour, it's going to be a set of questions that I've chosen. Um, we just felt they were topics that really covered a, a huge range of subjects and then for the last 15 minutes or so we're going to open up the floor so that anyone who feels they haven't had something um, an answer, mm -hmm. you know, you can ask Tracy about that and we will open it up. So I hope that makes sense. And then as I was saying, talking about microphones, we have got some lovely assistants in the audience with microphones. So those people who are asking the questions, please raise your hands, we'll come up with the microphone and then everybody can hear you. So does that sound alright? Um, and we will try and get through as many questions as possible. Now, I've just got to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, no fire alarm is planned tonight, so if it goes off, don't panic. We're going to get the staff from the Hepworth and they will take us to the safe designated areas. Um, we also have the marvellous Julie here tonight. She is going to be doing our BSL interpretation. Thank you so much, Julie, for coming along to the Hepworth. And if anyone wants to leave the room at any point and just go to a quieter, safer space, then that is absolutely fine. Just let a member of the team know and they will take you to that area. So thank you for your patience. And I've got some breaking news tonight, and that is the pay and display car park. It's acting up the tickets. Did anyone experience that? No. Oh, a few nods of heads. So don't worry, just go to reception after this and we'll sort it out. Is that okay? So the microphone is on, Tracy. Yeah. Goodness me. Yeah, yeah. Experienced TV reporter of 20 years. <laughs> and it wasn't working. So 
we will start. Now, our first question is from Daz. Oh, Daz. Hello, Daz. And Daz, Hello. before you ask this question, the microphone's coming your way. What a fantastic name Daz do have. <coughs> it's Darren. Oh, but honestly, <laughs> that's your show business. I, I got that's to talk that's <laughs> So Daz, do take it away and ask Tracy your question. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Could I just ask, does Wakefield get the same investment per head of capita as the rest of the West Yorkshire district? We always seem to be an outlier in respect of Leeds and Bradford. Whilst it appears that they are thriving, it feels like we are dropping further behind and my fellow residents are feeling like a bunion on the heel of the Leeds metropolis. <laughs> Oh, blimey, crikey, we don't want you to be a bunny, that's for sure. Um, firstly, can I just very quickly say thank you all for coming. This is our first one, and I was really nervous that nobody would come. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to a really robust question and answer. So, to this particular question. So, for, the, for those that don't know, West Yorkshire is made up of five different districts, five different local authorities, and the way that money is devolved through devolution to our region is that we have to bid for it. So the amazing Wakefield, it's one of my <coughs> favourite patches and isn't the HEP with extraordinary. Um, uh, Wakefield would have an idea for an infrastructure project or there would be a bidding round that government would announce. They would bid for it and they might get it or they might not. And this is the crazy nature of the centre deciding you know, who gets the money. You might remember that when we got the bus uh, service improvement plan money, 77 million, Sheffield and South Yorkshire applied for the same funding pot and got not a penny for buses. I mean, it's just crazy. So we would have um, the local authorities bid in um, into these big beauty contests. Bradford, for example, um, they bid into the Leveling Up Fund and it, was, um, it cost them 600 thousand for the support to get their Odsall Stadium bid in for levelling up money. Didn't get a penny. What a waste of money. This is crazy and nonsense. So part of what gets developed is what government give us. They are time scales that often are over a five year programme. So it's hard to actually allocate one year in Wakefield versus one year in Bradford and one year in Calderdale because these projects ebb and flow. But fundamentally, it is completely wrong that we are bidding against others. So our wins are other people's losses. It just makes no sense. So for those of you that follow Devolution, and I'm just such a huge fan, um, you may know the Greater Manchester and West Midlands have what's called trailblazer deals, which is a single settlement of money, so they don't have to do that. They don't have to keep bidding in. Now, government are working out what that formula would look like. And then we have uh, tried to say to government, we are ready for a trailblazer. We want that single settlement. They had no appetite to give it to anybody else. They said, we're going to wait for this pilot. And that finishes in uh, 2026. So we have fought really hard to get a four, a level, what's called it's technical, but level four devolution deal, which means at least we get a consolidated funding settlement for levelling up and a consolidated funding settlement for transport. Now this is going to be hopefully announced in the spring um, um, budget or uh, financial announcement that the, the uh, Chancellor is going to make. It doesn't work. Now devolution works, we know it works, but this system um, is not devolution that we are bidding in for EV charging points. I know, we know where we would benefit from EV charging points, not somebody in Whitehall or Westminster. Now, to your point about who gets the most, I think all of us can accept that Leeds is a, a really important part of our narrative as West Yorkshire. That's where we've got the Bank of England, the Infrastructure Bank, or the government HQs are there, the uh, Financial um, Conduct Authority, you know, uh, Channel 4, really big corporations. Of course we need Leeds to deliver on those big ambitious plans, but there are people in Wakefield that work in Leeds and they need, you know, they need those jobs and they need um, those opportunities to go to great colleges for kids and young people. 
So what's really important for me is the park and rides, the transport issues that we're all facing. And I have been lobbied so often, quite rightly, by your councillors about the poor parlour state of the bus network. Sure. So I'm sure that, I, I can imagine there's going to be questions on buses, I hope so. But without, a, without that plan, that transport plan, this investment won't work because people won't be able to get to those great opportunities. But I really hope that you believe that having a mayor with a strategic vision means that there will be no place in West Yorkshire that does not get the resources it needs to flourish. Fundamentally, the problem is also delivery. When do we have to deliver on these big infrastructure projects? And we have seen 250 million taken out of local authority budgets because of uh, cuts from the centre. I mean, a quarter of a billion we've lost. We have local authorities who had great plans, but the, now they can't find the planners, they can't afford the project. I am doing my bit, and we um, identified over 50 million that we could give back to local authorities to support them with their funding um, uh, issues at the moment. But if you haven't got the teams to deliver the project, how can we deliver? So it's quite a complex landscape, but rest assured, my vision is for, what, for West Yorkshire as a whole to thrive. And also, each local authority has its own uni unique identity. And what an amazing identity Wakefield's got. The Hepworth, the Sculpture Park, um, Kappa College, that brilliant station that gets you two hours to London and you know, access to those great opportunities. I think Wakefield's on fire and your, your year of uh, culture as well is going to really put it up there. So I really hope I've reassured you that it is not my intention that you feel that, um, that you are left behind. If you feel it, then we've got a better comms job to do. So I'm really grateful for your Can question. Can I come back? We'll yes. get that, because yeah. we're going on to buses next. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, please, please do, do, do come back. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think generally people do believe. We, we have to believe. You know, we've, we've had, what, 30 years now of deprivation in many respects. And councils are here and have seen it themselves and have to fight this stuff. We, we have to believe in something. I think the thing to remember, though, for you, the mayor and your team, is that Wakefield isn't just here. Yeah, Wakefield absolutely. goes out yeah, a long way that further, way. Further and when you're talking about the transport, there's no point having a great transport system from Wakefield City to Leeds if them from out there can't get here. Well, we've got a good news story on that. I hope we get you to are. Buses. Yes, with the winter buses and, right. and, and train connects. So thank you, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. thanks, thanks. Yeah, and if, before we move on, anyone wanted to just chip in about that? Is there anyone who feels a bit like that, that the sort of left behind the big city of Leeds? Um, or you're hopeful from hearing what Tracy said, that you know, that she will sort of push that you will have those connections and, and not be left behind. So, but buses are a big issue, Tracy, aren't they? Which we see a lot um, connection to Leeds. So we've got another question from... Carol Beanland is Carol hand up here. Thanks, Carol. Just wait for the mic, please, and then if you would just stand and give you your question to the audience, please, that would be great. Okay. Is that all right? Yes, I know so much. We can see you. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Raymond. Um, my specific question is about the Route 110 bus service run by Reef Buses, which is actually supposed to run every 15 minutes between the great cities of Wakefield and Leeds. We live in Robin Hood, in the middle. We've been here a year. All my neighbours tell me that the service was brilliant until about two years ago. Mm. And now we're looking for bus turns up. So we can stand in the bus stop for 40 minutes as pensioners in the cold and wait for the next bus to come. Unfortunately, the little menus in the bus stands don't work. My phone telling me my next bus <coughs> is not working. And we've been to the Metro office, we haven't contacted your office, we've contacted Ariba. No one seems to explain properly why. We've heard that it could be due to shortage of drivers, but COVID is still an excuse. I don't think it's good enough. And this, is, consist help, this is consistent, this yes, problem. Yeah. 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 I think. I think it's been getting worse. But with no notice and no reliability in that. Story. Yeah. Thank you, and that will not be an isolated incident. So just for those that don't use the buses, um, the bus operators, and we have basically three, Arriva First and Transdev, and they run 
Um, the networks as a business. COVID has meant, and I think it gave them an opportunity to cut the routes that for them weren't profitable. For them, because they're a business, it's profit over people's connectivity. We are in a, in a, a partnership arrangement with them, <coughs> but I have no control over the routes that they cut, um, and I, I have no levers actually to insist uh, they reinstate, uh, apart from paying them to run those routes. Now, <coughs> when I became your mayor, one of, I think it was in week three, um, I started the process to look at public control of our bus network because it, I'm a commuter, I use the buses, I commute on the trains, I've stood at the, those bus stops, I've seen buses fly by me, I've seen the ghost buses which are really annoying. Luckily I'm in a position of authority and I can ring the bus companies and they say, no, the bus was there, Tracy. And I say, I'm stood here, the bus has not come. Um, and I know the issue and it is wrong that people are not connected to great opportunities and jobs and loneliness has increased when you can't get out and about across your community. So we started the process that was far too long and complicated, driven by government's um, framework. We are now at the point, March the 14th, I make the decision to whether we go to franchising, as you may have seen in Greater Manchester with the B network, where the, uh, the control of the routes is um, taken away from those who are doing it for profit and given it back to the people. So that will be a decision that I will be making. But it doesn't solve the here and now. So when we applied for the bus service improvement plan money, um, I knew that I had to get more people to use the bus after COVID. And the way we did that was to bring in the mayor's fares. We were the first in the country to do it, the two pound fare. Government copied our idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> West Yorkshire leading the way. Um, and so the Mayor's Fairs has actually seen an, an uptick in, in um, footfall, but there's no point having a Mayor's Fair if you've got no bus. So what we've done is we've um, used some of that money to introduce, and in Wakefield you're getting uh, better services from the 16th of Feb, 16th, 17th of Feb. On the 444, the 446, um, evening services, you're getting nine from um, hour later, half hour. So there will be more uh, services coming, but I am going to refer to Simon on the 106. Is that what it's called? Yeah. The 110. Simon, have you got any answer for this lady? So the first answer is, uh, I do apologise if you know the right answers for Metro, um, and I will pick that up for you tomorrow, and I'll, I'll uh, get your contact details. Um, at the end, uh, we need to sort out the information and stop for you straight away. We do genuinely know that uh, Arriva seems to be having a problem in terms of uh, recruiting enough drivers. Now, um, Tracy has launched a programme to support uh, bus companies um, with recruitment. That's been very successful elsewhere. So we did have a conversation uh, just a week ago with uh, the Managing Director of Arriva where they raised this. And we're going to look to try and push the same programme through Arriva um, so that we can pick those issues up. So, I'll get your details at the end and I'll be on the backs of a few people for you tomorrow morning. Thank you, Simon. And if I could just say that programme, the bus operators were saying the reason why we can't arrive on time and our buses are cancelled is because we don't have the drivers. So it was unique in the country that working with the operators and myself, we launched a programme to get a thousand more drivers. And one of the, the places where I can have add, add value is in skills, because I've got devolved uh, responsibilities over the £66 million adult education budget. And working with a company called Realize, we run a bus driver training program. But we didn't just run a training program, we used it to support communities the furthest away from opportunity. So there's um, an estate called Homewood in Bradford, um, uh, the uh, route to success and realised people went into the community. They opened up a closed community centre that had been closed for a number of years. They renovated it, new lighting, gave it a lick of paint, started running these courses. But of course, once you open a community centre, the community used the centre. So alongside the courses, we've got stay and play and cooking classes and other training courses. There's one running for security uh, teams at the moment. But that course has delivered 100 drivers who are already now behind a wheel 
with 40 coming through the programme. So that's 140 families that have now got somebody in a, a decent job that I think is well paid with prospects to go on um, further up the, uh, the wage um, ladder. So doing what I can and also pressurising the companies, the bus companies, to offer part-time um, contracts for drivers. And then you get more women and people with caring responsibilities. You open up the opportunities, you get a more diverse workforce. So from a number of angles, I'm trying to do my bit to make it better. But once, once it's a, a company that is doing it for profit, they have a different agenda to the agenda we have in this room. And what we care about is getting people around our region that it's, it's cheap, it's reliable, it's consistent, <laughs> it's clean and it's green, all of those things. But as a, as a commuter myself, I feel your pain and I know Simon will pick up with you directly. Yeah, we hope, you know, Carol, that the next time you stood there, it's going to stop. <coughs> it's going to stop and it's better for the environment, you know, we're all being told to use public transport. So we're going to stick to public transport, we're going <coughs> to the trains. Uh, so is um, Jonathan here, Jonathan Earnshaw. Jonathan, we'll just get the microphone to you, talking about the railway station. Welcome, Trace. Hello. It's wonderful way Good to I see you. I love it, I love it. Good to see you too. Um, I wanted to ask you about if you would support the, a new railway station for the commuters of Holbury and Ossie, which actually could then serve as a hub, a transport hub for our Wakefield rural communities. I love Holbury and Ossie, and Holbury in particular is an absolutely lovely um, centre um, with amazing shops and cafes. Um, we have a transport plan that is coming to the Combined Authority um, soon in <coughs> March, isn't it? So, so we'll be consulting this summer on, this on, summer. on the new plan. On the new plan. And we're looking at what the, the previous plan was 2014, so obviously we want to refresh it. And we have looked at this, because you've been great in lobbying my office, um, we've looked again at Holbury and Osset. And the challenge with Holbury and Osset is that it has to have a business case that works. It has to be good value for the public purse. And there are other schemes, we are building um, stations around the region, and there are other schemes that have uh, a business plan that actually delivers because the, the numbers of the community are uh, economically sensible. In that Osset, Osset and Holbury would work if there was more housing. So as a community, you'd have to take a view on that, that if you had more footfall, you'd have a better economic argument uh, for that investment, but added to which we also need to understand the capacity on the rail network for extra stopping trains and you know as well as I do that we have east to west, north to south, a, a real capacity issue that HS2 was going to help us with and also I'm making the case Network North should be helping us with but currently still doesn't solve the problems of the, the absolute overcapacity of Leeds station. And actually the problem of the, trans, the Network North offer from government is it hasn't addressed that problem of the, of the you know, overcapacity at Manchester and Leeds. So there's a job of work to do there about where would you even be able to stop a train there because that would then hold up a fast train and so on. Um, we have a similar issue with um, the, an airport, the airport station leaves Bradford, C can we have stopping patterns on those, those fast lines? And so it's part of a bigger picture, but I know that you won't, you won't stop campaigning, and I really hope you do continue, because I know that the, you have great advocacy in that community. So thank you for reaching out. Because I, I guess, challenge. Tracy, what we're hearing from Carol, I know Carol, you're a pension retired, but people in rural communities on the outskirts of Wakefield, they'll feel they're missing out, won't they? Yeah. They yeah. want to live in these lovely parts of the world, but they can't just get but That's why the bus network is so yeah. important. That if you're in a village without a bus, and you don't have a train, and that's why, for me, the five towns in particular, I think have been poorly served. There's a real transport desert there. So when I've been speaking to my teams, 
I, let me tell you, what about Wakefield? What about Wakefield has been a mantra of the sick of it. Because I, I know that the opportunity is greater in Wakefield than in the city centre of Leeds. Because they're quite well served, because it's profitable for the bus companies. So they run many routes and it's you know, every 10 minutes or whatever. But I think Wakefield has been poorly served. But we can boost the economy of Wakefield by making sure that everyone has access to jobs and training. And that's how you thicken the labour market, by making sure transport works. Yes. Jonathan just wants to add something. Just, uh, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry to be brutal. <laughs> well, you, you're Nobody brutal, likes bad news. Brutal today. and disappointing, but, um, but I appreciate the honesty. But what can you do to help us achieve that? Because we are talking about transport hub here. It's not just necessarily, mm. yes, the railway station will be incredibly uh, preferable, but actually could then be a transport hub for, as Lottie said, those wait for rural communities, bringing that traffic in, getting the cars and vehicles off the road and actually using it. So there's there's opportunity. So it could be that we need to look at either a consultation plan or a commons plan. Mm -hmm. But what can you do to really help us achieve that in partnership with, with our councillors? Well, active travel, and that's part of Transport Hubs, isn't it? is a big priority for me and um, Chris Boardman who is the active travel czar from, from government uh, has said that we're one of the best performing in the country when it comes to cycle routes and active travel and walk it ride it campaign that we've been running has, has gone down really well but I'm very happy to talk to you further about how we can make sure the bus routes come you know nearer where the, the communities feel they need them but this is what I was saying about our transport plan We've got to have buses that serve the people that need it. It isn't always about profit. And think about where we could use that money that's going to Shell's pockets, uh, where we could use it elsewhere. But as I said, the decision is taken March the 14th, so watch this space. But we'll pick up with you yeah. outside of this meeting. You've, got, you've sent us an, um, an email already, haven't you? Yeah. So we'll just pick it up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Keep your campaigning up. Now we're going to go to small business and enterprise support, very important at the moment, mm -hmm. isn't it? Recovering from the pandemic and also cost of living. So if we have Jane Walton in the audience. Jane, are you? Oh, she's already got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, thank you very much. Just a bit of context and welcome, Trey. So, um, so I represent two organisations here today. One is the Federation of Small Businesses and the other one is the voluntary community and social enterprise sector of which I'm an advocate. And my own business is a social enterprise where the majority of my work is supporting those people who maybe just don't think business is for them. So at the moment we're working with uh, newly arrived migrant women across the whole of West Yorkshire. So my question is, what is the support available for small businesses in particular and social enterprises? Because I know you've made a real commitment to business, but I think it's the definition of that. Well, firstly, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, amazing. How you got the time to do that, run a business, and all of those responsibilities. And also the Federation of Small Businesses, thank you too for your engagement in the Fair Work Charter. You know, we worked really, really hard to get that over the line, so thank you. So I think your point is really well made, actually, because 96% of all our businesses in West Yorkshire are SMEs. And they have different challenges to some of the larger corporates um, and I think the last few years have been incredibly bumpy, whether that's COVID, um, energy bills, the cost of living crisis, <coughs> hospitality, you know, recruitment, Brexit, um, it has been incredibly challenging. The churn at the centre of government as well, you know, handbrake turns on policies, promises not delivered, it's been incredibly tough. So, you know, I'm behind you and support you all the way. Now, there's a number of things that we're doing in this space. Um, so, for example, uh, we have growth hub managers that work directly with businesses to help you um, access funding, um, uh, access funding for business sustainability. So, for example, we can match fund your um, renovations uh, of your processes or your building so that you have lower energy bills. Um, so you could be changing a boiler or lights and it's up to £8,000 and we've allocated £10 million for that project. 
And so that's really oversubscribed and people are really finding that incredibly useful because it makes a massive difference to a small business, the cost of your energy. Um, so you have three growth hub managers and they work within the council. So please do access them. Since I've become your mayor, um, we've supported 1,000 businesses in Wakefield alone. Um, I'm really pleased about that. And uh, one example is, um, I've forgotten the name of the company, but they make uh, windows and doors for conservatories. And they accessed 24,000 as, uh, as part of a grant to uh, green their processes. And they saved 26,000 on that year's energy bill. I mean, that's quite something, isn't it? But it's not just that energy bill. They also saved tons of CO2 and emissions, which actually is a sweet spot for me. I help business, but I also tackle the climate emergency. But to your point about social enterprises, now there are people that are quite, they've got a great idea, but they're a long way away from making it happen. So one of the first things that we launched in the first few months of being mayor was Enterprise West Yorkshire six million pound fund for entrepreneurs, people with an idea for a business, but we made it really clear, 50% of uh, that money was gonna go to women-led businesses, 20% to people of color, 10% to people with, who um, identified as having a disability. And I'm really proud to say, thank you to my colleagues who have smashed those targets. But that, mo that money is in three tranches, so uh, please do check out Enterprise West Yorkshire. Um, I, I think the work that you do with refugees, it was really important to me to, as uh, someone with responsibility for adult education that if you can't speak English, why are you locked out of having access to English because you can't afford to pay? So we've made ESOL free. And actually now we are so oversubscribed, which is brilliant, <coughs> we're having to train the trainers because we need more trainers, because we need to roll this out more widely. But if, if there's more that I can do with you, for you, I think the social enterprise model, the cooperative model, um, is the training I, we are giving our growth of managers, because I think there was a bit of a, um, not, not a siloed approach, but a, this is what a small business looks like. But actually there are many variations, from, from a woman starting out a cooking company on a, kitchen table to a group of friends who all mend bicycles and want to set up a cooperative. So the, there's lots of ways to do this. And I was startled the other day that 95% of notonthehighstreet.com, they are individual women, female-led businesses. So these are cottage industries that then become bigger businesses. So the support traces, isn't there? I guess sometimes so just knowing to say, I'm slightly is. rambling, but yes. The support is there. And as someone from the FSB, Please, you know, you can always reach out and we can go through in more detail what's available. Fantastic, because we want these entrepreneurs, don't we, we to do. be in West Yorkshire. So now we're moving on to the safety of women and girls. And so have we got mm -hmm. Madeline here? Madeline France. Oh, Madeline, thank you. We'll just put the microphone thank to you. you. Thank you so much. Um, so as the founder of Blossom and a BCSC for Ice and Our Safety Together Partnership Board and as a woman of West Yorkshire, I'm extremely proud of the work that Tracy Braben and Alison Lowe do um, to keep your pledge, to keep that pledge to the women and girls at the heart of all that you do. So I too am driven by lived experience um, to do all I can do to reduce violence with a keen focus on ending Borg. Um, there's tremendous works and projects going on across West Yorkshire. So as an ambassador as Women Friendly Leads, we also have a great initiative, it's Women Coming Together, um, which shows strength and unity. So my question is, when you've mastered West Yorkshire, um, and it's the safest place for women and girls to live, how are you going to share your findings of what works and what doesn't work with the MPs and the mayors across the country? <coughs> Thank you, what a brilliant question, and such a supportive question, yeah, thank you, but you, you recognise that the work we're doing. So when we um, consulted on our police and crime plan, um, we put the safety of women and girls at the heart of that plan. I am the only female Metro Mayor in the country. I have lived experience of sexual violence. Uh, I, I can imagine there are many uh, women in this room and men in, in this room that have uh, been subject to um, harassment, violence, 
and uh, I thought it meant a, a great deal to me that we could lead in, in, this, in this space. So there's a, there is so much that we've done. Um, uh, when it comes to talking about it nationally, I think one of the, the big things that I'm proud of, the, the place we've got to, is that we are now uh, working with Dame Louise Casey, you may know that she was brought in by the government to um, assess the Met, and she had some recommendations, and working with her, we're setting up uh, the Women and Girls Safety Unit, which is um, going to take a public health approach to how we tackle violence against women and girls. But also, to our male allies in this room, please do check out Just Don't, which is um, a campaign that we've run, it's a video, already it's had over 3 million views, and the statistics just blow your mind that 86% of women have experienced sexual harassment in public. And the, the men I talk to about it, they just can't believe those numbers because that's not them and that's not you. I'm sure you're our allies and our, our friends and neighbours and sons and husbands and we need you to help us with that plan. So when it comes to telling the story, well, as mayors, I, uh, um, we come together to share good practice, but I want to come to Alison on this point about how we how we amplify it at a national level because Alison's really taking um, a, a, a really <coughs> senior role in um, Labour Party thinking for potentially a new government. But um, Alison and I together, really leading on this agenda, <coughs> I hope, and I know it is naive really to make West Yorkshire the safest place to be a woman or girl, but if you don't have a target, you'll never reach anything, will you? But Alison. Yeah, I'll stand up so you can all see me. Um, so, um, in West Yorkshire, uh, the, the Mayor funded some research uh, into the safety of women and girls in parks because uh, we, were, we were being told uh, that women didn't use parks, didn't use public spaces because uh, they didn't feel safe. Uh, and so the Mayor commissioned Leeds University to do a piece of research which absolutely confirmed that the majority of women did not feel safe. Um, and so, as a result of that work, we co-produced some guidance uh, that we've now shared with every local authority in the country. We've shared with every MP in the country. Uh, the University and West Yorkshire Combined Authority went down to Parliament and talked to a load of MPs in a select committee about the learning from that research and the, the design guidance. Uh, we've now been um, uh, approached internationally to share that design guidance. So that's just one example of how uh, Tracy uh, has used her uh, uh, position and her uh, lived experience as a woman to try to amplify the voices of women and girls, but also improve the, uh, uh, the experiences of women and girls, and given us permission to use those spaces that uh, belong to all of us. Um, and uh, the other thing that we're doing, but this is uh, outside of WICA, is that I am uh, a member of Yvette Cooper's uh, Charging Commission, and the Charging Commission has been uh, brought about because of the powerless um, outcome rate. So if you uh, are a, a victim of rape, which I have been, um, the uh, chance of you getting a positive outcome in this country, uh, in, in a court, uh, is about 1.6%. Um, and that has gone down and down and down uh, over the last uh, 10 years. So we're looking at charging more perpetrators of uh, high harm crimes, uh, rape, serious sexual violence, uh, uh, domestic abuse, to give victims confidence that the system works for them because currently the system is not working for anybody, including police, CPS, probation, etc., etc. Uh, and so we're hoping to be able to um, uh, bring all our findings together. So I'm leading on victim support because I have been a victim of uh, rape and, and domestic abuse. And hopefully, all the commissioners who are part of this piece of work. Uh, they're all working on their own elements. We'll bring together lots of new policy and action uh, for the next Labour government, if the Labour government is uh, indeed elected, um, and that will see a marked difference, we hope, in the way that the criminal justice system not only works, but works for women and girls, and you uh, as men and allies, because we are your wives, your daughters, your sisters, your nieces, etc., etc., uh, and you want the best for us, uh, as we want the best for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I just may just finally yeah, yeah. add to that, that uh, we've also set up the Women of West Yorkshire Network. And Fatima, I wonder if you could just very quickly just say um, a little bit about that, because 
Um, we're hoping that this will become a movement across West Yorkshire. Fatima is my inclusivity champion. She is um, helping me. Um, uh, we share Fatima's time with health and she is helping me to reduce health inequalities across West Yorkshire. So with one foot in the health camp, one foot in the WICA camp, um, she leads reaching out to those communities that are the furthest away from power in the centre. So Fatima. Thank you, Tracy. So very quickly, um, the rationale behind having an inclusivity champion is because we recognise that health is wealth and, and only good health comes with having better prospects, which is why we're so lucky to have Tracy. Um, the Women of West Yorkshire Network is a network open to anybody, so that is women and allies uh, within West Yorkshire and beyond, and it's an opportunity for real women to come together from all walks of life to talk about issues that are really, really important to them. So, for example, we met yesterday, we had a great conversation about the forthcoming uh, climate change chat that's going on at the moment, and if you want to be a part of that, please do uh, contribute to it. About Tracy's aspirations for an inclusive uh, strategy as well, and making sure that the economic prospects in West Yorkshire apply for everybody because we know women in particular have significant challenges. So if you want to join the Women of West Yorkshire Network, do get in touch, it's open to everybody and we want to create a, a movement of change for women from all walks of life uh, to improve outcomes for everybody, so it's open to women and allies too. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you. So <laughs> that's you know an initiative that you, Paul yeah. and Tracy and your team will take to other parts of that's right, Yorkshire. that's right. And yeah, yeah, leadership is showing others what would be fantastic like. if we were what saying like. where we went. Yeah, brilliant. Now we're going to have to Teresa Kirk because we're going to move on to student mental health. Hand up. Thank you, Teresa. One sec, we'll just get the microphone to you. Thanks so much. If you could just stand up, then everyone can see you. Thank you so much. Good evening, good evening, Tracy. Hello. I enjoyed your question last night. Oh gosh, thank you. It was it was quite crazy. Steve Bannon and Keir Starmer, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so I'm Tracy Kirk, I'm founder of a small organisation called It's Saturday. And one of the things that we do is run an outreach project for the students in Leeds. And we run out of Cardigan Community Centre on Burley Road. We provide support with cost of living crisis, we provide advice and information about how to protect mental health. We run wellbeing drop-in sessions and we're completely self-funding. We get up to 400 students a week coming through the doors. Um, as I said, we're completely self-funding. We've approached universities, we've approached the local authority. We've put in funding bid after funding bid, but now this seems to value the mental wellbeing of students in Lee's all. So, and we've also paid for research from the Beckett into the support that students get on a societal level and the literature review showed that there is none on a societal <coughs> level. So my question is, given the lack of support on a societal level and the concerning numbers of university students reporting poor mental health, do you think more support should be done to support initiatives such as mine? It's on prevention. You can't evidence prevention, mm. so then it's very hard to get somebody to fund. Thank you, and honestly, thank you for what you do because so many young people have left home and they're adrift and they're trying to make ends meet and we've got bad landlords and they're lonely um, and, you know, all of the societal problems of trying to make ends meet, I, I just think the pressure is enormous, so thank you for what you do. Firstly, I have a programme called the Mayor's Community, um, what's it called, the Mayor's Community, Save for community. Sorry. Save for community, thank you. I've, 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 too many communities. The Mayor's um, Save for Communities Fund, uh, which is proceeds of crime money. So we've um, had over a million pounds of money that criminals have taken, mm -hmm. but our brilliant police forensic officers have grabbed back, and we then um, allocate it to community projects, up to £8,000. It has to fit a bit of criteria, uh, but we have seen the impact of those programmes absolutely, uh, exponentially brilliant because it is people who live in the community and make a difference. I, <coughs> I'd encourage you to apply, but also um, the Mayor's Cost of Living Fund that we launched in October last year when the crisis was really deep, um, we allocated three million and the, the first one million was given out to straight away to local authorities who knew their communities and they gave it to community projects on food, warmth, um, support with debt management and mental health support. 
Um, that project we thought would reach 3,000 people. It reached 6,000 people. The need was so great. And Citizens Advice Bureau worked spectacular in this space. Just shout out to all those volunteers. So we've now decided just that the two million needs to just go out because the need is great, the impact is fantastic and quite life-changing. Um, but also when it comes to mental health, I'm really lucky that my deputy mayor, Alison, was the CEO of Touchstone, um, which is a large mental health charity. So lots of the things where we discuss have that as a theme and that we try not to forget um, uh, the challenge around mental health. So please do try uh, and reach out to the, uh, the Mayor's uh, Safe Communities Fund. It's so, such a good feeling those evenings <coughs> as well, when we're giving out grants of £8,000, the money that has been taken from criminals, harming communities, and we're giving it back to those communities to heal. And we have a great team that organised that programme, so please do give it a go. And anybody else that has a community programme that might be changing lives. Because we do find that sometimes, don't we, Teresa? You, you're out there with your support and then people just can't access you sometimes, mm. you know, and the waiting lists and people are struggling, but good to know you can... Well, if I just may mention as well, if there's anything in particular, I meet the Vice-Chancellors on a regular basis, um, I'm uh, the heads of further education colleges, just tell me what I need to tell them. Because if they're not, if they are not um, across the poverty and the, the, the struggle of their students, they need to be. We, we right. worked, sorry, it no, worked no. out it cost about two pound fifty per head, and the feedback from the students is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just peanuts. Yeah. yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank if you, you can thank um, you yeah, that. get that to everyone who needs it. Thank you, Teresa. Well, we'll move on now. We're going to biodiversity. So have we got Holly? Oh. <laughs> Next door. <laughs> Holly, can you just wait? I have but I've gone off script. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Tracy. Hello. Um, biodiversity is our strongest natural defence against climate change. I don't know if everybody knows that. I've only recently found that out. Uh, the UK has lost more biodiversity than any other country in the world. So it's not all about tigers, it's as much about hedgehogs. <laughs> Please, can you tell me about the biodiversity strategy for West Yorkshire? Thank you so much. Well, for those that don't know, we, we have um, a climate <coughs> and environment plan. Um, if we were to deliver all of that plan, it would cost us 4.4 billion because the need is so great. We are committed to net zero by 2038. Government is 2050. So we have to work at speed. And biodiversity is part of, we, will, we take responsibility for biodiversity, it's, our, it's, it's down to us to make sure that that works. Um, we allocated 40 million to um, deliver the most urgent mitigations, the most urgent work from the climate and environment plan. So part of that is the white rose forest, um, it's also peat management, um, slow the flow so we have to get upstream so you know slowing the water in the air means less flooding in Castleford and uh, north of, of Wakefield. It's really important we have that strategic view across the whole of West Yorkshire. Um, it's also about training uh, youngsters um, into careers in this space so my commitment to a thousand green jobs We've uh, now got 1,147 pledged, so I'm really pleased that we're um, beyond the target. But also the work that we can do in schools and colleges, um, talking about the climate emergency. The Mayor's Innovation Prize last year was, uh, tell us how you would solve the climate emergency. And um, the winners then had a wraparound <coughs> support from Innovate UK and financial support to look at how they turned that into a business. So the biodiversity is part of our package. But just to also mention that mass transit is going to be one of our biggest infrastructure projects of a lifetime, of a generation. It is going to connect the whole of West Yorkshire. We're going to have spades in the ground on mass transit by 2028. But that is not going to be a, a, a light rail 
in a concrete jungle. This is our opportunity to make, to make biodiversity the first thing we think about rather than an afterthought. So that's why I was really pleased to get a presentation from my team, from the Mass Transit team, exactly on that topic. How are they going to ensure that there are, you know, there's, there's water mitigation, there's, there's plants and flowers, there's wild meadow opportunities, there's trees, there's shade. All of these things, I'm planting trees under whose shade I will never sit. I but, but I know that it's important. Back. Do you want to come back? Yeah, I think that it's really interesting. It's just <coughs> to me as you're talking about the importance of connectivity to people and communities. <coughs> All the things you talk about are brilliant. It's important your country. But what biodiversity needs is connectivity. Yeah. It can't exist in isolation. And a lot of the damage that's taken place is that we've preserved one little area. On the yeah. So when this fantastic transport system, I know we need it, I know people, you know, if you think about the connectivity of the biodiversity at the design phase, yeah. and then the crucial thing, yeah. I think that would, you've got this opportunity to look at how human beings, you know, and all other species can really live in West Yorkshire. And I think that's what devolution gives us, just very quickly, that's what devolution gives us because it gives us that strategic overview. Um, and we have a plan, and we will share it with you if you contact my colleague. And we get the buses and the trains working. <laughs> it's an exciting time to be in West Yorkshire, I'm telling you, there's so much going on. Fantastic. So what we're going to do now, Tracy, is going to open the floor to you guys. So anybody who feels um, that gentleman now is straight up with the scarf and the blue. And there's no such thing as a silly question. No. So, um, <coughs> so I think Tracy can take in a couple. Okay. Yeah, in three. <coughs> in three. Is that all right? So we'll start. Where's the microphone? Oh, no. Um, this gentleman here first. Thank you. And then we'll say your name. Yeah, if you say your name as well, that'd be great. Oh. You're as bad as me with that microphone. I used to be on the stage here. Oh, good! Oh. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Daniels, and I'm a member of Tristan Parish Council, and I've been for nearly 30 years. I was a lay person on the Combined Authority subcommittees in the cities for a long, long time. My working career was with British Railways. I started in 1961 as a messenger. When I retired, I was an operations manager, so I know a little bit about trains. I also had a PSP driving And what annoys me, and I'm very annoyed about this, is that when you became there, you sent, sent a letter saying, thank you very much for what you've done, goodbye, go away. No consultation whatsoever. Now, on the Wakefield one, there was five of us on that committee, and three other people, two were in the railway industry and one was in the bus industry. We know a little bit about how or what about things would work. But you got rid of us. And the reason why you got rid of us was because we asked embarrassing questions. And I think it's wrong that the late, the, the, the rank and file don't have a say in the combined authorities anymore because we have been, we've got the rough end of the stick. You're about no buses. I live in Durkee. We have a bus. It runs every hour and it finishes at 8 o'clock at night. What use is that? Right, so, thank Trace, you do you want to thank you. Yeah, no, thank thank you. you. Let's, um, so, Trace, we have another question. Do you want to respond to that one? Um, no, we we'll take them in yes, place, yes. so we can get through yeah, more. Yeah. I'd like everybody to have the yes. opportunity. This gentleman here. Thank you. <laughs> and any ladies, get your hands up. Come on, not all the fellas. Well, good evening. Uh, my name's Roy. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing, by the way. Yourself and your colleagues here at Wakefield. But well, I want to ask you a question. Coming right down to the nitty-gritty, within the council, I mean, you have different departments, in transport, planning, parks, everything. Now, I want to know what polices these people. They're not the councillors, and we're not talking councillors here. I'm actually talking about the people. Let's take planning. You know, when you try to get into planning and talk to somebody and discuss it, you hit a brick wall. And you just can't get through to absolutely anybody to get any answers off them. So when things do go wrong, or you think things have gone wrong, all you want is an explanation, and you just can't get it. You know, yes, they work for the council, yes, they have managers, but who actually polices them? And when things do go radically wrong, as you know that it recently in Leeds, when Leeds had to pay out over a million pounds to a chap, uh, who wanted to put adverts on a roundabout and wasn't allowed to do by the local authority, and he took them to task. 
And five years, these city council spent money trying to win their case. And guess what? They lost it over a million pounds of ratepayers' money. And I believe something similar, even though it's not roundabout, with Featherstone uh, Sports Centre, where the council sold the land to a developer and then proved planners, approved planning permission. And guess what? They got it. But they didn't get an access road. So guess what? Wakefield ratepayers now have to pay for the construction of an access road. So these people who are making these decisions that are costing millions of pounds of our money are not held to account. Thank you. Right, we'll just thank you. Yeah, thank you. We better just get the, the very question very for this. Yeah. This gentleman here with the oh, well sorry, we'll just go to this lady here just to be fair and then we'll come to you in a sec. <clears throat> I'm uh, Lorraine and I run a support group for families affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, I have a lady here who did actually send you a question, uh, one of our mums that comes along. Um, I think our big question is if you can possibly help us. We, the NIA government, um, produced a nice quality standard in 2022, March 2022, so we're nearly two years on that stated that our families and young people should have diagnosis, support and management plans and as of now they're still not in effect. I'm just wondering if it's something you could help us with. Right, thanks you guys for all those questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Peter, the subcommittee. It sounds, I, I wasn't here so I don't know, but it sounds to me like you were advising the combined authority going into devolution, would that make sense to you? Would that make sense that you were advising the change of the command authority? No, it was the, our advice was when the, 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 the buses and the trains was are Was it transport run, advice? Transport. When the buses and the trains are run, we wanted to know why. Right. And another example, I know I'm going to have fun, is a situation at Wakefield Kirby Station where they were going to put toilets in. It was all agreed that an application went through and it stopped. Now, okay, it's okay, thank you. Our voice is for I hope that you see this evening that actually I am here to listen to the public. And it may be that there's a strange, uh, there's a change in the structure of the organisation that has meant that the committee structure um, ha was no longer necessary in that way, but it was um, turned into a different way of scrutinising the combined authority because. Just to let you know that there are currently three scrutiny committees um, and they're cross-party and they do ask me some very awkward and difficult questions um, and I am open to scrutiny because I cannot ask government to give me more money and more power and more devolution without that public scrutiny. That's why tonight is actually so important. That's why it's really important that I go on and so does Alison on Message the Mayor on radio, BBC Radio Leeds. And, and you, can, you can send in any question you like to me or Alison in Message the Mayor. You've asked me the question this evening. We can definitely pick that up with you about <coughs> um, where the, uh, the passenger's voice is being heard in our organisation. It's something we could definitely take away and, and Simon's nodding. So we can make sure that, that we're very mindful when we're developing our transport plan of that, of that conversation with the public. So planning, Roy, uh, planning isn't me, I'm afraid. I don't cover planning, that is your local authorities. But to your point of, about not necessarily getting timely answers, just to repeat, local authorities have been shredded and their planning departments are one of the most overworked departments in our region because I am demanding transformational projects, development, affordable housing, planning, bringing people in from abroad, they want, they want a new um, a business park. The planning teams are run off their feet and I am now talking to my um, adult education teams about can we run courses, can we run boot camps, can we ensure in the way that we did with drivers that we solve this planning problem because it's no good. It's no good that we can't get planning through. And I was at a round table with Michael Gove and developers. And to be fair, your, your 
concern was shared with developers as well, that why do we have to wait so long for planning? And they, they as businesses are bringing in their own planners to turbocharge planning. So um, uh, your point was uh, well made. I know that the, the councillors are here, so they will have heard what you said. So on to, on to, yes? Just one other thing though, that the crux of the question was, yes, we know everybody's being cut mm -hmm. to the quick, but it's when things go wrong, when it costs an out and out fortune, when yeah. people make these mistakes, these are experienced people as well, by the way, quite high up in planning, right, who decide to take on a chap, or he decides to take them on. That's a detail, sir, that I'm not across, so yeah, I think we'll we'll let's keep that personal, we'll that we'll um, we'll individual detail. Okay. We'll, we'll Sorry, Roy, I'm, yeah, I'm not being rude, but just, no, it's you. something that I don't oh, know much about. Oh, so, Lorraine, fetal alcohol syndrome, that is such an important um, organisation because so many youngsters' lives are, you know, they, they don't get the good start, do they? I have no responsibility, sadly, for... Um, children in that in that way but actually Fatima as my inclusivity champion uh, could maybe talk to you afterwards about is there anything that we can do about health inequalities and so on thank you Fatima thank okay. you so much yeah and I'm sorry when we can't go into too much detail sometimes but certainly the people here that you can have chat to afterwards. they've heard they've heard you yeah, yeah definitely so three more and I did say to this gentleman here in the group we'll come to him first and then we will come over to you and you Thank you so much. Hello, uh, James Stevenson. Um, I'm the branch secretary of Wakefield Ward South, just down the road here. A uh, very simple question for you, but a very expensive question, Tracy. Um, in London, if you're over 60, you get free bus pass. Outside of London, you've got to wait to say pension age, which can be 65, 67. Um, I see G2 have a fair spare policy, and we standardise it so if you're over 60, you can get a free bus pass. Um, sadly, I, I'm going to be disappointing, I'm afraid. Currently, there is no plan to do that. The reason why London is quite a historic um, uh, offer, the reason why London can afford to do it is because they've got the tube. We don't have the fare box. What's really important for me is to make sure that we have the routes. There's got to be some priorities with the money that we have. I've also been lobbied by people who use a, 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 a concession, a disability pass, that they want to work, they want to get to work at nine o'clock and they have to wait till half past nine. We've talked to the operators, maybe a pound fare, maybe a way to work that, but that would cost us many millions. So when you add it up, it is incredibly expensive and it is unfortunately about prioritisation currently. But let me tell you, when we have our mass transit system, we'll have much more liquidity and we can maybe look at maybe free for children or free for um, you know the, the over 60s but currently uh, I'm, a, I'm afraid that's not a priority. Can I suggest a 65? <laughs> 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 oh you're all straining now, you can tell you're a counsellor. <laughs> I like it, Tracy, very diplomatic, not committing to that. <laughs> uh, this gentleman here with the glasses. We'll just wait for the microphone, thank you. Hello there, my name is Spansley. I'm helping with the local NHS Mental Trust with their public consultation to improve hospital stays um, across uh, Calderdale, Kirkland's and Wakefield for dementia and other mental health needs. I just want to know um, that I just want to say that public transport, especially for older people that need to travel across these places to hospital sites, can be difficult and include multiple buses and long waits and walks. And I just want to know what is happening to improve public transport across Calderdale, Kirklees and Wakefield. And are you happy to explore any opportunities with our team on working on these to find uh, public <coughs> transport solutions to actually support these individuals? Thank you for that. I'll, I'll answer it yes. very quickly. Obviously, we're in Wakefield, so I'll talk about Wakefield. But there is a good news story, isn't there, Simon, about Pinderfields? Uh, yes, so we will be bringing forward a new uh, bus service through to Pinderfields um, from the summer. I think the, uh, the the other aspect that I'd certainly be very keen to talk to you about at the end. Oh, Simon, is, just grab that mic. Thank sorry, you. the other aspect that I'd be very keen to talk to you at the end is is the role of access bus and how access bus might be able to um, help. So let's have a chat. Thank you, and just to let you know that we've rolled out the orange wallet 
that you can get for free. So if you have a disability that is hidden, you can just show the driver, you tap like normal, but you have an orange wallet so the driver knows discreetly that you might need a bit more help. You might have hearing loss or, or uh, you might have dementia and so on. But also, just to very quickly touch on, my dementia um, uh, ready task force, which is for housing, it's a really big priority for us. We know that people are living longer, dementia is uh, with us, it's not going away. Um, and to make sure that my housing policy also ensures that houses are fit for the long term and people aren't um, forced into care homes and so <coughs> because their home isn't fit for purpose. But thank you for your work that you're doing as a young person, um, uh, supporting others making decisions. Thank you. Certainly when you go to hospital and you've got these appointments that you might wait weeks for and then you, you miss it or you can't get there, it, it's important. It's it? I think we've got one more. I'm going to have to, if we make it really quick, we can do these two. Don't tell me off anybody who's in charge, because this gentleman here and this lady behind, please, if that's all right, just get the microphone. We'll try and keep it brief, but they have been putting their hand up for the last 10 minutes. Gen uh, this lady here, right next to you with long hair, dark hair, and then this gentleman in front, please. Thank you. Hi, Tracy. I just want to start by saying thank you for everything you're doing with the buses, because we really need it, so thank you so much. Um, my question is about um, homelessness, what more can we do? Uh, I work on I work in Leeds City Centre and I have to walk past homeless and it comes in all ages and it's devastating to walk past, devastating, it breaks my heart. So I had an idea of a wishing well in Leeds City Centre because we're doing all this work in Leeds City Centre at the minute so I just thought this was the perfect time if you put a wishing well in Leeds City Centre People donate, they come from all over the world to Leeds City Centre um, and their wishes, which will be their donations, would go towards homeless food, uh, clothing and um, mental health. Mental health, you know, speaking to somebody about how they feel, of the conversation. Um, I can't take all these people home with me, <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> but I really want to stress that I wish you well with donations towards the home. Can I just say, you're the best of Yorkshire, you are. <laughs> and, and thank you for your compassion. And something, let's take that away. I mean, we could talk about homelessness, but we are short of time. But it's also not my responsibility, it's councils. But there are definitely things that we're doing in that space. So thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. And just finally, we've got this very patient man. Just wait for the microphone here. Yes, we do. But yeah, we see, you know, as a news reporter, homelessness has never been worse, you know, so that is just a wonderful idea, so I think you need to be, you need to be getting that in the local press. <laughs> Brilliant idea. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, questions relate to previous questions. The, the first question was about Leeds. The, what we see is that um, cities such as Leeds, Sheffield, they're getting bigger and bigger to the detriment of our local city, which is a, a concern. You mentioned about bus services. You remember saying all roads lead to, uh, to Rome. All bus services seem to lead to Wakefield City Centre. Um, recently, our, it was problem with our local chemist, uh, so we had to go from Crofton to Charleston. To do that, you have to catch the bus from the village centre to Doncaster Road, Go down Doncaster Road, cross the road, get another bus, come back before you even got to before you got to Charleston. So, what could be walked for those able fifteen minutes took you over an hour by bus services. So yes, good to get buses to Leeds, but it's, it's the local interaction that is required. What numbers are those, sir? Sorry? What numbers are they? What number uh, bus numbers? There's 196, 496, 495. I'll say they're, they're all interlinked. Uh, and, and just finally, uh, it's been mentioned about rail services. Crofton used to have three railway stations. We've had massive redevelopment in Crofton, but nothing seems to have been done by the developer to promote public transport. We've got to third on the list for a railway station. We've got second on the list for roads of other stuff. 
as soon as it's our turn, though, oh, all the rules have changed. So uh, it, we find it annoying. Whilst we appreciate what you are doing, but it's local. Um, where we live, people work from Crofton in Sheffield, Doncaster, Leeds, Pontypridd, all over the place. We well, can't get there by public transport. Yeah. Frustrated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and certainly just to answer that question about Leeds getting bigger and bigger at the detriment of Wakefield. I just want to counter that argument because we have to have that thriving city that brings in that international investment. And I was just at an event earlier with Rachel Reeves and the financial services sector. We are the biggest financial services sector after London and Edinburgh, the biggest in the country. That brings in fantastic skilled jobs, investment. Um, opportunity. Most of the people that work in that sector, 65% have a level four or above. We have to have these great jobs for our young people if we're going to keep them in our region. And if they stay in our region, they're going to live in Wakefield and work in Leeds. You look at Manchester, you look at London and other big cities, the cities do shine, but that does not mean to say that's at any detriment to the outs, out, you know, outlying cities. Grace, it does. We haven't got the infrastructure in Wakefield to well, build out. I think, I think the point is that we need that connectivity. <coughs> this is where... What about doctors, chemists, exactly, gentlemen, just exactly. mentioned schools, dentists. You know, dentistry in Wakefield is absolutely on its... But across West Yorkshire. Yeah, but I'm people are putting out their own teeth because they can't you know, get... You can't keep bringing people in Wakefield to work in Leeds if you haven't got the services in Wakefield. They're not spending money in Wakefield. The spending money in Leeds. So how does Wakefield benefit? I would say that the, the pattern of work has changed so much that people are working two days at home and using local services and then going into the city. But not everybody goes into Leeds. People work in, live in Wakefield and go to Barnsley to work. They go to Sheffield. They go down to, you know, across to Bradford. This is the brilliance of West Yorkshire. If I can get the transport right, People can move across the whole of the can region. You add education to that as well. Absolutely. That's for another time. That's another time. time. We can tackle education yeah. another time. We're going to thank have you to all leave so much. Tracy, Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you.